Hey, I got two passages for you guys tonight. Go to Exodus 19 and go to Acts 8. The two passages for tonight are Exodus 19 and Acts 8. I'm going to go a little bit quicker, but lean in. This is, a, this is really, really good content coming tonight. While you go there, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us in our time tonight. Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you for beautiful weather. Uh, thank you that everybody that came tonight was got here, be, be able to get here safely. Uh, thank you for everybody that came. Thank you for community. God, we want to ask that your word more than anything is what's spoken tonight. More than Bryson's words, more than anybody else talking in the group. God, may your word be spoken tonight because it is your word that we live on alone. And so as we gather and as we lean in, God, would you speak to every single one of us in some unique way? Would you speak to our hearts and would, would, would we hear from you whatever it is that you have for us to hear tonight? We thank you for your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Hey, y'all, we talked last week <clears throat> about setting a vision for the year 2024. And if, if you remember, we talked about this discipleship pathway. We talked about how we wanted to be a church known for our love. More than anything else, we wanted to be known as a church for our love. And how all of our systems, everything that we do, flows into that. How we operate is the exact opposite of a traditional church for that reason. Remember, we talked about how traditional church models were literally the opposite of this. They start with you coming to the gathering, and then after you come to their gathering, some kind of Sunday service of some effect, then you get plugged into some way of serving, whether it be chairs, whether it be a greeting team, whatever it might be, then you get plugged into serving. And then after you serve, hopefully you get into some kind of a small group. And that's where you build your community and you have deeper conversations. And then after small groups, maybe, maybe, we just hope that you get plugged into some kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship with someone and you have coffee, and you have dinner dates, and you have deep, meaningful relationship. And we said that we're doing the exact opposite. Why? Because we want to be about love. This is more risky. But we want to be about love. And we already established last, last week that the current system is not working. So we flipped it and we said we're going to start with one-on-one -on -one relationships. That the, the first place that people will encounter One City Church is through relationships. And maybe if we build enough relationships and if we build enough meaningful relationships, the next place that we invite them to is into a house church. And we established that we have three different kinds of house churches with the opportunity for more. But we're going to invite them from a relationship into community rather than into a gathering space. And that's a crucial key difference. And after they get into house church, then you're going to serve together. And we do compassion. We serve side by side together in the community. And maybe, just maybe, after that, someone can come to our gathering, which is here and now. And so we set the precedent last week from the stage, and we said, this will probably be the smallest space for One City Church that we know of. Because this space is for leadership. This space is for the people committed to the vision of One City Church. This is really kind of the, the, the spearhead of a movement. We are movement people. And so this is how we structure our movement, which means two things. One thing in particular, we have got to get really aggressive about how we build relationships with people. The next thing that it means is that we have to get really aggressive about building house churches. Either internally or externally, we've got to build house churches. Because house churches, I believe, is the way to reach this new generation. Not through a Sunday service, it's gonna be through community. So. That was a recap of last week. That's our discipleship pathway as a church. I wanna, what I want to do today is just take that next step. And I want to ask, like, hey, like, what is step number one for us as a church? Because, yeah, that's a cool vision. We want to be about love. Everybody wants to be about love. What does it mean for us to be about love? I want to take the next step. Two years ago, I shared an illustration some of you might remember this, of this thing called geometric progression. Do you guys know what this is? This is so cool. 
Geometric progression is the idea. Lauren Whitehead, yeah, Michael knows. Lauren Whitehead, a couple decades ago, coined the phrase geometric progression. And, and, and Lauren Whitehead determined in the American uh, Journal of Physics that, that a, a two inch domino had the potential energy to be able to knock over something 1.5 times its size. So a two inch domino could knock over a three inch domino and a three inch domino had the power to knock over a four and a half inch domino and so on and so forth. Here's where it gets crazy. By the 18th domino, you are able to knock over the leaning tower of Pisa. But from, from 1 to 18, the lean, but hey, it's leaning, so I don't think that's really fair. Uh, by, by the 23rd domino, though, you're able to knock over the Eiffel Tower. By the 29th domino, the Empire State Building. Faith works the same way, my friends. Faith works the same way. It's called geometric progression that if we would just focus on what our two inch domino is right now, and if we got committed to that two inch domino, because you have to stay the course, that's the whole point of this, you've got to stay course, and if we, if we switch gears now, this will not work. What is our two inch domino as a church? What is your two inch domino as a person in your life right now, that if you would just focus on this, because our problem is we cannot focus on the Eiffel Tower, we cannot focus on the Empire State Building, that's where we want to go, yeah. But let's start with that two inch domino. What's ours? The very first coffee shop that I worked at, it was in the town of Bartlesville, Oklahoma. If you've ever been to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, it was because you were passing through on Highway 75. I promise you, you would not stay in Bartlesville, Oklahoma for any more than a gas stop. But this was my college town, and I loved this town quite a bit. My very first coffee shop was a really cool little shop in this little town. And I remember I had a friend named Dallas Horsley, who's still to this day one of my closest friends. Dallas Horsley, uh, and I both went to ministry school together, and then we graduated. We worked uh, in this little coffee shop together, and then we both moved out to Oregon together. And we spent, he's there to this day. He was our youth pastor, I was a discipleship pastor, and we worked together very closely. But I'll never forget, something switched within my mind one day at this coffee shop. You see, Dallas and I had both gone through ministry school. We had both spent years in ministry together. Uh, we both learned a lot about our Bibles. We both learned a lot about how to be a pastor. And there was this strange interim time in both of our lives where we worked at this coffee shop and we just didn't know what to do. So Dallas, one day, he was my roommate. He said, Bryson, I'm going to challenge you today. We've been reading this Bible. Uh, we might, might as well use our time that we have here effectively. What if we... What if we had a competition, and what if we tried to remember whoever had the most names at the end of this day? I said, okay, let's go for it. And at the end of the day, we'd come back, and we'd, we'd share how many, and we'd always like fight over who could be on the register and who'd be on the bar, and you know. It, but at the end of the day, we'd come back and we'd share how many different names that we could, you know, had, had written down, and, and, and it, so we, tallied up whoever won and whoever lost, but then it, it, he, here's the thing with every game is it's not enough just to stay at that one game. You have to go further, right? It's, if you've ever had two boys living in the same house, it's, it's always a progression of games, one thing after another. It's never enough just to like play this game. And so Dallas and I, it went from learning people's names to then remembering their names. So if they came back in, who could remember the most names whenever they came back? That was a fun game because people like to be remembered, all right? So people would come back, we remember their names, I got a point, he got a point, we tallied it up at the end of the day. Well, that game also kind of got old because at some point you just, it's a small town. You remember everybody's name, which is cool. So we made it another tier higher and we said, can you remember some piece about their story? So you have to ask, not just what their name is, where are you from, what do you do for work, What's your favorite hobby? What do you do for fun? Something about them. You had to remember that. So then we tallied up and that was our new scorecard. And I remember 
that this became so much fun for the baristas that, 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 that we built this kind of camaraderie as baristas behind the bar that because because we were starting to remember people and customers and their stories and it was really really fun and exciting for us as baristas but something strange also happened the kitchen which if you've ever worked in a restaurant, the kitchen of all people is like not the ones that want to get involved in this kind of a game, right? The kitchen wanted to get involved in whatever the way they could, so they started having little competitions too. What did this all result in? Well, the staff got excited because we were doing something fun and it was outward focus. The kitchen got excited because they got to be part of it too. But there was a day that Indian Coffee Company closed and we made a big announcement that Indian Coffee was closing and that this was the last day that you could come in. And I'll never forget because I worked the register that day, there was a line out the door and down the block. And I remember it was probably the hardest day I've ever worked in my life in coffee because every single person that came up to that register had to share their appreciation of this space in some way. You guys remembered me. Thank you for creating this space where like, yeah, it was a coffee shop, but you guys kind of made it a little bit more than a coffee shop. I was known here. Thank you for that. Story after story after story. Thank you for this space. Thank you for you guys. Thank you for knowing me. Thank you for seeing me day after day after day. To this day, if any one of those regulars were to walk into this space, I would know their name, I would know their story, and they would know mine. That day that Dallas challenged me to go outside of myself, to go outside of his self, and to learn someone else's name was a day that we learned what it meant to live on mission. And so my question is, what would it look like for you to create a sense of mission within your workspace. Oh, but I'm unemployed. Okay, what would it look like for you? Sorry, Dev, I, I did not mean to, I, I was, it was literally my next thought. I did not mean to just point that out. <laughs> He's in between jobs. <laughs> school, start school Tuesday. He's starting school, yeah. Sorry, Dev. Unemployed, great. What it, would it look like for you to adopt a missional mindset about your family? What would it look like for you to adopt a missional mindset about your specific life? <clears throat> Exodus 19. What I want us to do is pay attention to Exodus 19, but with one little caveat. I don't, <laughs> this is going to be really strange for a pastor to say, I don't actually want us to pay attention to what it's saying as much. Like, pay, please pay attention to what the Bible's saying. But, but I want us to really pay attention to specifically what they're doing. And, and forgive me, I'm really cold right now. Like, I'm freezing. So if I'm kind of jittery and all over the place, that's why. I'm, like, really, really cold right now. Woo! <laughs> We're in Texas, though, so I can't complain. Um, what is it, like 30 out? That's fine. We're good. 27. Okay, great. 27 is still warmer than South Dakota. Um, Exodus 19. And we're paying attention to what is taking place here. Exodus 19, I'm in verse 3. It says that, Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, and he said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples of the earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and this is key, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So pause, One, just real quick. Moses, in order to have this conversation, had to climb a mountain in order to, to just talk with God. Have, has anybody here ever climbed a mountain before? A couple, okay. 
this is quite the feat to just like go and have a conversation with, with God, okay? So then what he's supposed to do is he's got to go down the mountain, right? So he's got to descend just to talk to the people. So Moses returned from the mountain and he called together the elders of the people and he told them everything the Lord had commanded him. And all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. <laughs> so Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. <laughs> So, so what's about to happen is they're, they're about to enter into a covenant. So this is pretty similar to like a marriage. You know, they're, they're about to exchange vows and have this agreement with one another. And so you kind of get the sense that these are very like wedding day-esque type, type things. And so what's happening is Moses goes up the mountain. God says, hey, I want you to tell the people these things. Moses goes down the mountain. The people go, yeah, we agree. We will do these things. So now Moses going back up the mountain to talk to God. And he says... The Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud, Moses, so the people themselves can hear me when I speak to you. Then they will always trust you. That was the whole point, is that he's going to come in this cloud so that the people themselves can hear me. Key point there. So Moses told the Lord what the people had said, and then the Lord told Moses, Okay, go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothing. Be sure that they are ready on the third day. For on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai as all the people watch. Mark off a boundary all around the mountain. Warn the people, hey, be careful. <laughs> Do not go up the mountain or even touch its boundaries because anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. No hand may touch the person or animal that crosses the boundary. Instead, stone them or shoot them with arrows. Okay, just this is not it has nothing to do with the passage or the message for tonight. This is just the fact that God is holy. He is very separate from us. And we have got to just understand that that we are not holy. And so in order for something that is not clean, not holy to even come in close contact with something that is as holy and perfect as God is would mean death. Okay, that, that, that's, that's just the reality. And, and I think at certain points in history, we were very familiar with the fear of God and with the, the, just the reverence of God. I think this, this day and age, we, it, it, we don't quite grasp that sense of God as deeply as other generations have. And so we have to just come with a sense of reverence to who it is that we're, in, we're coming in contact with. I'm going to pause there because what I want to highlight in this passage is just, just kind of the nature of what's going on. Moses climbs a mountain to God. God gives Moses a, a message for the people. Moses goes back down the mountain. Moses gives a message to the people. <laughs> then the people say, yep, let's go. We agree. So then Moses goes back up a mountain. He gives more orders. Moses goes back down the mountain. And Moses tells the people what to do. And then three days later, God says, all right, let's go. This is what we call in leadership, elephant-style leadership. This takes a very long time to mobilize people. There is, just full disclosure, a time and place for elephant-style leadership. Case in point, if you've got a lot of craziness happening on the fringes, people doing whatever the heck that they want to do, maybe it's time to centralize a few things just to kind of get on the same page and then disperse, but, but really, for the most part, elephant-style leadership is not effective if you're trying to create a movement. Unfortunately, as a church in the West, we've operated off of an elephant-style leadership for centuries now. And it's time that the Western church wakes up to what God is doing on a global level. I was talking with a German pastor, at one, uh, I think it was a few months ago, and the German pastor made this really crazy, audacious statement that I just, it really stuck with me ever since. He said, y'all, the church as we know it currently is preventing the church how God wants it to be. Not in many parts of the world. As a matter of fact, in most parts of the world, God is doing some incredible, miraculous movements. But as far as the church in the West... Church as we know it is literally preventing church as God wants it. So go to Acts 8. 
Because this is, is, in my opinion, the way, well, not really in my opinion, this is quite, quite case in point, uh, Acts is the way that God desires his church to operate. Acts, after all, is the book of the Acts of the church. So Acts chapter 8, verse 1 is where I'm at. And so this is a direct contrast. What I want you to see is the direct contrast between Exodus 19 and Acts 8. Just a little bit of context real quick. Stephen, if you know the guy, uh, say hi for me. He's actually the first martyr of the entire church. He just gets killed for saying some really, really bold things in Acts 7. The religious leaders don't like that kind of talk, and so they killed him, and then mass persecution starts in the, in the church. And so Stephen becomes the first martyr, and this is really where, if you were with us last week, I talked about how, um, you know when you squish a pregnant spider, and then you got millions of babies that spray all over the place? This is that moment for the Acts church, where like, they killed Stephen, and then that pregnant spider just sprayed babies all over the place. You know, what I mean? and it's terrifying. It really is, especially if you're Satan. Um, literally, it just sprayed hope all over the place. But it did not come without persecution. So a great wave of persecution came. Uh, I'm in verse 1, just kind of part B of verse 1. It says that a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So you see what's happening. They got this centralized thing that got squished. The apostles stay, but everybody else goes. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning, but Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But... The believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. That's key. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria, and he told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miracles, the miraculous signs that he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So... There was great joy in that city. Fast forward to verse 12. Uh, they include a story about Simon. It's a cool story, but uh, for our sake today, we're just going to fast forward to 12. Actually, 14. Sorry. Verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard about the people in Samaria... And they heard about how they had accepted God's message. They sent Peter and John there. And as soon as they arrived, they prayed for the new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. And now pause. Because many scholars have misinterpreted this passage incorrectly, to the detriment of the church. Many scholars believe that this passage is about our need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Entire denominations have been formed because they believe that you need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit and fire in order to be saved. This is not at all what is being talked about here in Acts 8. As a matter of fact, N.T. Wright quite vehemently disagrees. Yes, they were given the gift of the Spirit here, but... This is not about the need to have the gift of the Spirit. What this is about, just take a step back. Persecution breaks out, people get scattered. What do they do? They share the message as they go. What happens when your church stops meeting on Sunday? Do you, do you just cease to exist as a church? Most churches in America would say yes. We are no longer a church. We don't meet on Sundays anymore. We don't have a small group that meets during the week. Whatever it might be, we're no longer a church. Church in Acts, they get squashed. They start spreading the news wherever they go because that's just who they are. Key point. They take that identity with them wherever they go. They take this message of good news wherever they go. And so what happens is 
people start coming together. And I start going, oh, this is a cool message. And they start leaning into this message of what Jesus has to offer for them. And they start creating these, these salvations and baptisms and, and people, people wanting to follow Jesus and learning how to follow Jesus. And, and, and so they're basically creating little micro churches, house churches, wherever they go. It's crazy. And what's happening in this passage is... Peter and John get wind of what's happening in Samaria and they go, hey, let's go out there and let's do something. Let's, let's evaluate this body of believers and let's, let's just make sure that they're the real deal. So they go out and they go, yeah, this is it. This is the real deal. Let's lay hands on these people. And N.T. Wright says that this was more of an act of unity than it is about anything else. That they are with us. Because at this time, a lot of false teachers were popping up, a lot of strange cults were popping up. We live in a day and age where a lot of strange cults are popping up, right? This was more of an act of saying, yes, they are in alignment with us right now, and we are one with them. Let's go ahead and pause it, reset it. So cold. Why not jacket? I've got a sweatshirt, but it does not... Are you guys freezing? Yeah, I'm just like just blowing the air. Like you're not. I'm like getting sniffles. I'm shaking up here. I need to like jump around more or something, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fire. Whew, I was hoping my coffee would last longer because that's hot. Did you did you just hit it again and so we're going to, we're good again? Okay, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> This will be one cohesive thought in a, yeah, sometime. I don't think I've I don't think I've ever had a cohesive thought in my life. Nope. <laughs> Acts eight is about unity. They, he was they were joining into the church. So the church as we know it is preventing the church how God wants it, my friends. China alone has over 10 million house churches. Wrap your brain around that for a second. 10 million house churches that we know of, at least, with millions more popping up all over India, the Middle East, and Africa as well. For reference, okay, just to help you wrap your mind around how many house churches are in China right now, the state of Michigan has roughly 10 million people living in it, okay? That's a house church for every person in the state of Michigan. That's, that's in the, the entire country of China right now. The Texas Triangle, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, Austin, the Texas Triangle has 20 million people in it. And that would be one house church for every two people in the Texas Triangle. Let that just blow your mind. That's a two to one ratio, which if you're in the coffee world, that's espresso. Okay, very, very strong cup of coffee right there. That's how many house churches are literally just in the country of China that we know of, at least. Not to mention the, I mean, the countless that are popping up in Africa currently as well. The house church movement has called, quote, been the fastest growing church movement in the world. So my point is, if we're seeing trends of a national church exodus in America, maybe it's time that we open our minds to what God is doing in the global church. As a matter of fact, I would say this might just be as people committed to this type of discipleship pathway, this might be our greatest obstacle. As a matter of fact, just even today, um, I've had a few people ask me about our church and how we do things and wanting to get plugged into a church. And even just today, I had three people decide just to go to a traditional Sunday service because that's what they wanted to do. That's great. I'm not going to bash that at all. As a matter of fact, we support that. But everything in me is just going, look, y'all, I did Sunday church for many, many years. I am the person I am today because of that style church. A lot of good things. I am so ready at this point in my life to throw out anything that doesn't support me, my family, 
others in the pursuit of becoming who God has called us to be. And I really do see Sunday gathering churches as more of an obstacle to true discipleship than it is actually encouraging it. Why? Because if you teach people to consume, then that's what they'll do. But if you teach people to serve, to give away, you might just find discipleship. Francis Chan talks of what it was that sparked his desire to start We Are Church. Francis Chan, if you don't know, was a mega church pastor, really big speaker. He got a call from a pastor friend in India one day, and he was just bawling his eyes out. And he was just, she was like, "Why? What's so? What's what's wrong?" And he was like, "I'm I'm just Francis. I heard of another pastor in America who." had a moral failure and so had to completely his, his church just fell through because, because he, he, he had this moral failure and, 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 this, and this pastor from India was just bawling because he, he goes man sometimes when I talk to your American pastors I just wonder whether or not they even know God like pastors not even just church members but like pastors like I, I talk to them and I just wonder like what is what is going on in America that, 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 that the church is just falling asleep people are all so okay with coming to a thing consuming and going home and feeling like they're okay with their faith and they're not they're not activated they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing and so he said you see Francis a lot of those American Pastors and church people, they just don't, do they not realize that they don't have to wait for Moses to go up the mountain? Like, they can actually walk up the mountain themselves now. Like, it's not just like, hey, we're going to wait for Moses to go talk to God, and then we're going to, you know, say, yes, we're good to go, and then we're going to go, and we're going to mobilize. Like, that's not how it works anymore. We are a kingdom. An entire kingdom of priests. Do you know th what that means is that every one of us has the ability to actually talk to God, to walk up the mountain, to say, God, I, I don't have to worry about this boundary anymore down at the foot here. Like I, because of what Jesus has done, can actually walk up this thing. I can talk. I can commune. I can figure out what it is that God wants for me in my life. And then I can come back down and I can share it with the world. This is where the concept of the priesthood of all believers comes from. And this is really where the Methodist movement started. It's just a simple concept that you and I and you and you all have the same ability through Christ to commune with God. After I left my church in Oregon and I resigned... Um, it was quite difficult to find a church to get plugged into, which is a strange thing to say as a pastor. I can't imagine how hard it is for someone non-Christian to get plugged into a church family. But we just started organically gathering with friends in houses, in coffee shops. And what we found <laughs> was that all I really needed, all Abby and I both really needed, wasn't necessarily like a church to get plugged into. It was more of just, we needed, we needed to be part of a bigger body. That's all we really needed. We didn't need someone to be like, all right, Bryce and Abby, you're good to go. Go start a small group. We didn't need that. We were, as a matter of fact, we were already creating church wherever we went with the relationships that we started. All we needed was just a family to be a part of, to be like, hey, you guys can hang out with us, like you can share life with us as you are living life on mission already. One City Church, the idea behind One City is not that we would be one because we're all gathered here in this space and we're one here. The idea behind One City Church is the same out of Acts 8. That as we go and as we scatter... And as you build relationships, and as you build relationships, and as, as, as house churches and communities form all over the city of Austin, that even though we are all over the city, we are still one church. In the same way that Peter and John went, laid hands on different movements, we want to lay hands on different movements that are happening all over Austin. But the way that that happens is by you and I understanding that you have access to God already 
You just have to believe it. The secret to activating the church in America is not a secret at all. As a matter of fact, all it really takes is just a bunch of really hungry people. A bunch of really hungry people, they gather together once a week, and they just seek the heart of God together. That's all you need. And they challenge one another to live faithfully according to whatever it is that God is calling you to do. The DBS style house church, which is what most of them are doing in the world, all they do is they just gather around and they say, okay, here's our scripture passage. What's God saying about us? What's God saying about him? What's God saying to me specifically? And who am I going to go share that with now? And that's all they do. And then they go, and they share, and they multiply, and it's literally going like crazy. That's the secret to activating the church, is just that you, we've got to realize that, that, that we ourselves already are priests, as you are. You don't need special training. You don't need to have some kind of worship uh, skills, some kind of teaching skills, some kind of Bible knowledge. You don't need some kind of skill set. You already have everything that you need at your disposal. It's Christ and Christ alone. So what is God calling you to? The only way to know is by talking to Him. <laughs> I was talking with a barista this last week. He's an incredible barista. He said... Bryson, I just don't get how some baristas are okay with putting out crappy coffee. I said, yeah, man, I'm right there with you. He goes, no, 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 like, I'm, I'm serious right now. Like, how do you, as someone who has pride in the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you not just, like, make something and, and, and find so much pride in understanding that, that like, this is just a, like this is about to make someone's day better and that that is a reflection of, of the work that you put. Like, that's really cool. And I said, yeah, it is really cool. He goes, how do people not get that? And I said, well, it's pretty simple. They don't believe in themselves. And if, and if they don't believe in themselves, they'll never believe that the work that they put in is worth it. And so this is why this is really hard to teach. Because what, what I'm trying to teach right now is identity, okay? I hope you see this. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to teach you that you are made in the image of God and that God loves you very much. And because you're made in the image of God and because God loves you very much and because he died for you, you now have a mission for your life. And that changes everything. Everything that you do, especially because we are Christians and because we have the Holy Spirit, everything you do has purpose. Everything you do is missional, whether you realize it or not. I can't teach you to have that. As in the same way, I can't teach a barista to have ownership and pride in their work and to, to, to you know, to, 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 to have a sense. I, I can teach you all the skill sets. I can teach you all the tools that you need. I can teach you a lot of stuff, but I cannot teach you to have a sense of pride. In the same way, I could teach you this Bible. I could teach you some practices for you to do throughout the week. I can teach you all oh, so many things. I can't teach you to take ownership over your life. That's your decision. This is the key to waking up the church in America. We've got to create a sense of hunger for God alone. No more, no more consumerism. No more communication. Just because you've got a great communicator, just because you've got a great band, just because you've got a lot of great things about your church, great! Do you have Jesus? That's, that's, because that's, that's what matters. And I know a lot of great churches that do have Jesus, that have all those things as well, but I just, I just, if you remove all that stuff, and if you just had Jesus, would your church still exist? And is that enough? I can't tell you what you are called to, and I can't make you own it. My friends, the message for you this week and my prayer for you this week is just that you would own this 
for yourself. This life, your prayer life, your relationship with God, it's yours. And so this week, we're going to enter into a practice together as a church. We're going to pray three times per day and just see what happens. Okay? This is what Daniel did. I was just reading the Daniel in the Lion's Den with Brooks, and so this was my inspiration. You can think... Uh, think nightly prayer times with, with Brooks for this, but, but I, I just I would encourage you just to try it. Pray three times a day. I'm not going to give you any rules outside of that other than pray three times a day. For some of you, that will mean waking up earlier, so you might have to sacrifice sleep. For others of you, that might mean uh, lunch breaks. You might have to be cut short a little bit in order to get that prayer time in. For some of you, that just might mean less screen time, which might actually be a good thing, right? Three times a day for one week, we're going to come back next week and just talk about what happens when we instill a regular rhythm of prayer in our lives. Because in order for, in order for this to even happen, you've got to have a relationship yourself. Otherwise, this is just structure. This is just... This is just a, a, a drawing. <laughs> Our two-inch domino this week. Our two-inch domino is you talking to God. Do you think we can do that? Okay. I do too. This is how you activate the church. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for these people and thank you for this message. Would we lean into this faith that you've given us? Would, you, would we lean into this relationship that you've given us? God, in the same way that we have to show up for our spouses on a day-in and day-out basis, may we show up even more so for you. I'm reminded that in every relationship, it takes cultivation and it takes work. We have to check in on each other. We have, to check, we have to let the other person know that we still love them. We still care about them. We have to communicate. These are basic things. God, you are no different. And so this week, would we just as a church collectively say, you are our priority. And the only way that your gospel message is spread is through us. And, you're, and just being your vehicle, just humbly coming before you saying, God, use me in any way. Use us this week, God. We love you so much. We thank you for all that you do for us every day that we don't even realize. It's in Jesus' name we, we pray. Everyone said, amen. One quick thing, one last thought. Uh, we did this last year quarterly. Roughly, no, I think we did this every six months. Uh, I have a map on my wall in my house of all the communities that we prayed for and prayed over. And I continue to pray over all those areas. But what I want to do this year is something a little bit different. I'm going to take that map down. And I'm going to have everybody make their own maps. And so if you want a map like this over the city of Austin. The idea behind it is that we're just going to, in your own time, pray to God and say, God, where would you like for me to, where's, where's my mission field? Like, is it work? Is it my neighborhood? Is it my family? Is it like, what's my mission field? Usually it's wherever you go. <laughs> you're just going to circle on the map those places. And you're just going to bring in an extra level of intentionality to those places. And then... After three months, after six months, after one year, you come back to the map and you say, God, have you blessed this? Uh, case in point, last year, around uh, a couple months ago last year, we circled South Lamar on this map. A couple months later, after we circled this uh, map, I had an interview with Josh and um, the rest is history. This exercise is really powerful, but instead of us doing it as a collective, I want to, again, activate everybody within the church to say, what's my mission field specifically? And then what would be really cool 
is in six months for everybody to bring our maps together and say, what, what have you been praying for? What have you been praying for? Well, this is what I've been praying for. And just see what God does and how he overlaps some things. So if you want one, let me know. I'll gladly get you one for next week. So cool. That's all I got tonight, guys. Thanks for hanging out with me.